Young Wing graduated from Yale in the class of 54. 1854. He was the first Chinese student to receive a degree from an American university and went on to pioneer a scheme to educate other Chinese students in the West. But it didn't last long. Political mistrust between America and China brought Young Wing's grand plans to an end and the students were summoned home. Today's Chinese students are experiencing similar pressures. The top concern for parents in China is the safety of the student, of their children. The COVID-19 pandemic has blocked borders and closed campuses, making it much harder for Chinese students to study in the West. For some universities, it could cause financial ruin, but for the Chinese government, it's an opportunity. Take almost any university in America, Australia and Britain, and it will most likely have students from China, lots of them. It's a legacy of a bold decision taken by the Chinese paramount leader in the late 1970s to reform and open up communist China. There's a famous conversation where uh, President Jimmy Carter, who established full diplomatic relations with China, sent his chief scientific advisor on a visit to China in 1978 to meet the paramount leader Deng Xiaoping. And Deng said, I want you to speak to your president right now because I want to send 5,000 Chinese students uh, to study in America. And so Frank Press found himself phoning the White House at three in the morning. And Jimmy Carter thought there'd been some absolute disaster. When he was told that it was Deng Xiaoping wanting to send 5,000 students, Jimmy Carter said, tell him to send 100,000 and then went back to sleep. By sending Chinese students to America, Deng Xiaoping was taking a gamble. Deng Xiaoping was not a liberal. He didn't want them to stop thinking that communism was the right system of government for China, but he was willing to tolerate the risks that they would be polluted with Western liberal ideas if they also learned all the things that have made America so rich and successful. The gamble paid off. Knowledge gained in the West has helped China become the economic superpower it is today. And the stream of students has risen from under 5,000 in 1985 to over 650,000 in 2018. The main destinations are English-speaking countries. Britain and Australia have seen steady increases since the 2000s, but the biggest pull is America, where numbers have nearly quadrupled in the past 10 years. Over 360,000 Chinese students were studying here in 2019. Chinese students now make up the biggest proportion of international students in the world. Hi, my name is Ketan. I'm, this is my third year studying a PhD in the UK. I think living abroad makes us more open-minded, so open to new things. I think it's not only I think the things that I can learn, but also the experiences that I will, I will have talking to people with different backgrounds. This is a plus on your CV, and I think if I went back to China, I think I do have a competitive advantage compared to those students who solely spend their time in China. For the universities, having students like Kitong has been a financial boon. At the University of Cambridge, Britain's top-ranked university, international students could pay up to six times more in fees than students from Britain. Despite making up 5% of the student population in Britain, Chinese students contribute 10% of universities' income from fees. In America, some universities are so reliant on Chinese tuition fees, they have insurance policies against Chinese students not coming. And they might be about to claim on those policies. Deteriorating relations between the West and China had already made Chinese students think twice about studying abroad. And then the pandemic hit. 3,000 members of this university family wondering what's next. Great deal of concern on campus for our international students. You know, we got very nervous at that time. But we got a stigmatization towards the Chinese community at the beginning of the pandemic when the virus got controlled in China. Many Chinese felt safer to, to go back to China. 
Now, the chaotic handling of the pandemic is shaking the confidence that Chinese families once had in Western countries. For those still keen to study overseas, it might prove impossible. America has blocked entry to visitors from China. Australia has pretty much closed its borders. In Britain, most universities are confident their campuses will be open, but many overseas students will quarantine for two weeks after arrival. At the moment, the chances are that they may have to study online back in China. If you're a Chinese family and you're getting the bill for the first semester of tuition and it's online only, that bill is going to be tens of thousands of dollars. That's a lot of money uh, to pay for something that you could get for free. Though it's a dilemma for Chinese students, it's a potential financial disaster for some Western universities. In Britain, some forecasts suggest that there could be as many as 50% fewer new international students starting their first year. A report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, a think tank, predicts this could cost British universities anywhere from £1.4 billion to £4.3 billion. The Chinese government has spotted an opportunity. They are very happy to use Chinese students as a form of leverage. So they understand that Chinese students bring a tremendous amount of money uh, to Western campuses and they have been happy when they've been having a diplomatic dispute uh, to use that. In April, the Australian government annoyed China by suggesting there should be an independent inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. And one of the forms of what looks a lot like kind of economic blackmail was suddenly the Chinese authorities saying that they believed that Australia was a dangerously racist country and that it wasn't safe for Chinese students to study there. It's not the first time that China has used its leverage over Western universities to bolster its soft power. Chinese officials and students have been vocal in their criticism of universities which have discussed thorny political issues relating to China. In 2017, Chinese officials reportedly banned new state-funded scholars from attending an American university that had hosted the Dalai Lama. Academics have raised concerns about the way in which the Chinese Communist Party exercises control over its students, which they suggest is often sinister. We've had congressional hearings in Washington uh, at which academics have given specific examples of how a Chinese grad student in a small class uh, in an American campus will say something critical of the Chinese Communist Party and the next day, back in mainland China, the Chinese police hammer on the door of that student's parents and say, your kid has been shooting his mouth off on American campus. That can only happen because another Chinese student reported their classmate. And the pandemic will provide China with only more opportunities for political and ideological control. Take studying online. Many Western websites are blocked in China. A group of British universities has been testing an internet link provided by Alibaba, a Chinese tech giant, which allows students to watch British lectures and access approved research materials at their homes in China. But the problem with that is that, as far as we can tell, those lectures and that streaming process will be subject to Chinese law. And so if you're a history professor and you want to talk about the Cultural Revolution and you want to say that Mao uh, you know, caused the deaths of tens of millions of Chinese through his extremist policies, can you say that? You certainly can't say it legally here in China. The repercussions of this are unclear, but the danger is academics feel pressured to censor themselves. There are university administrators who have been much too willing to sell out their own academic freedoms and their own values. No amount of foreign student revenue can be worth betraying those core values. Western universities need to be more confident in what they have to offer. If the Chinese government says, you know, we'll stop Chinese students coming to your campuses, actually they're bluffing because China gains a tremendous amount from being able to send students overseas. But Western universities and governments also need to make more of an effort to welcome Chinese students. If Chinese students were to disappear from Western universities, it would not only be a financial blow, but a geopolitical tragedy. The bond that Young Wing tried to forge almost two centuries ago would be even more fractured. We are 
more interdependent and better connected uh, than we have been before. We're trying something hard, which is to be open to a China that looks more and more aggressive and scarier and more competitive and more willing to use its kind of economic leverage and, and in some ways less trustworthy. And so it's hard to keep your campuses open to that China. If that China is hard to manage, would it be easier to manage a China that knew nothing about the West, whose brightest young people had no idea what a Western university was like? Um, and so I think that we need to hold our nerve and be confident that we do still have uh, something to gain. The trend of Chinese students start to study abroad will not be stopped. Anyone who will be the president or who will be the prime minister will encourage Chinese students to come because it will be a very valuable asset in the bilateral relationship. I'm David Rennie, The Economist's Beijing bureau chief and Chaguan columnist. You can read more about ever-increasing US-China tensions by clicking the link opposite. Thanks for watching.